All right. Welcome to this week's installment of Florida Talks at Home. Uh, we're going to give everyone just a minute or two to migrate over from the waiting room into the presentation. Um, while we wait, uh, we're doing a little fun survey here that we're going to talk about at the beginning of the program. So uh, go ahead and, and take a second, fill it out. For those of you who have never done a click meeting presentation, um, there is a little chat box in the bottom, bottom right hand corner. If you have any issues, your audio is not working, uh, you can usually restart. It'll, that'll usually fix it. And uh, we're going to do some Q&A at the end. So um, if you could just hold your questions till the end and uh, the speaker will answer them then. All right, give everyone one more minute or so. Again, if you're just tuning in, go ahead and uh, fill out this little survey that'll kind of gauge where everyone is ahead of the talk. All right, and we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome to this week's installment of our Florida Talks at Home series. My name is Alex Buell, and I'm the Public Programs Coordinator for Florida Humanities. Normally, Florida Humanities works with cult cultural partners across the state to put on programming like this in person, but obviously that can't happen right now. Our goal is to make this virtual series a regular event until we can begin convening in person again. Next week's event will be on July 1st at 6 p.m., and we'll have Dr. Gordon Patterson discussing how mosquitoes and mosquito control have impacted our state. You can register for this event on our Facebook page or on our website, floridahumanities.org. At the end of tonight's presentation, we have a very short survey. Before tuning off, it would be great if you could take a minute to fill it out. If you have any questions for the speaker, please type them in the chat field in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, and she'll answer them at the end of the presentation. Tonight, we welcome Professor Emeritus Magdalena Lamar, who taught the in the Humanities and Social Sciences Department of the Homestead Campus of Miami-Dade College from 1990 until her retirement in 2016. Lamar's interest in comic books stems from reading them during her childhood and excitement at seeing so many of those early superheroes featured in film. It also related to her history and sociology background, which has led her to examine the history of comic books as part of the American popular culture. In particular, how they reflect and have also impacted the social landscape of the United States during the time periods for which they are written. And with that, I will turn it over to Magdalena Lamar. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Can everybody hear me clearly? I guess you can comment if not. <laughs> I do speak quickly, so please, uh, you can tell me slow down. In any case, again, welcome. It's exciting to do this program. Um, I've always been interested in all of these kinds of topics, even from uh, very early reading comics as a child, but later any topics that have to do with mythology, with science fiction, um, with fantasy. So this is a, an important topic for me in that sense, but I'm also interested in how this genre has developed. As we proceed through the program, we're going to conduct a historical review of the emergence of female superheroes uh, in comic books. So please, for, for your information, the program is very visual. There's some points that, that you'll see some line, you know, writing, but po most of it is visual. And I'll be pointing out to things that I want you to look at. Um, and what you're going to be doing is what we call in sociology a technique called content analysis, which is very often used in this kind of medium. And it basically examines and records the content that you see. And then based on getting all that information, you start to reach conclusions, make analysis of what that content seems to be telling you, what, what message or information it's providing you with. This entails a very close examination of pictures, looking for details, patterns, and messages. And I do have a little pointer that I'm hoping I can manage, which will kind of point your eye to things that I'm talking about that I want you to analyze. Um, and, and see if you, as you go through the presentation, if you can identify specific themes. Okay. So let's get started. Um, how do I get started? <laughs> okay, there we are. So 
You can see from these visual images that I purposely picked images more or less of the era of about the 2000. Um, and unfortunately, for many people, these are the images that come to mind. I actually stopped reading comics when I was about 12. You know, comics are kid stuff. And there's also the stigma tied to them. So I stopped reading them, especially because what I liked was Superman. <laughs> I didn't read Wonder Woman, oddly enough, when I was young. It was Superman. I started reading it because my uncle, when he came back from the Korean War, uh, brought comic books to the house and he would share them with me. And that was my favorite. And then when Supergirl came out, also in Lois Lane. So those are the three of the comics that I was enjoying. My brother loved, um, what is it, Spider-Man. So there was this little art fight in the house. But this is something that has interested me, but I stopped dealing with it for a long time. And to a certain degree, um, it has to do again because of that stigma, you know, 12 years old and reading comic books about Superman, not very interesting for a young teenager. In general, what stigma does is it discredits some kind of cultural forms and also its practitioners, whether they be the, the people who produce or the people who read it. And comic books have always evidently, even their predecessors had been looked at as literary and artistic trash, just trash, I think you've heard that. Uh, and they've been credited with dumbing down the society because the reading level was supposed to be so simple. Um, analysis suggests that the stigma may have actually significantly impeded the development of comics or the evolution of comics as an art form in society. Okay, let me go to the next one to keep here. Now, what are some of the things that you may know? Again, they're childish, they're immature, the, the whole thing of not being serious literature, they're not serious art. Uh, remember, we're talking about an aspect of culture. So when you start talking about art and culture, or literature and culture, you're thinking of high culture and something that's considered socially valuable. Of course, they're very lurid and some of them were, some of the scenes were incredible, especially during the pulp era, uh, violent. And that's something that we see in all of them. Even in the popular movies today, there is a lot of violence and that leads to a question of who they're geared to. Uh, in those days in particular, there was actually a challenge and maybe today that it keeps children from reading real books because they're reading you know, literary trash, comic books. And the biggest stigma, even though the biggest market we're going to see are adults, the biggest stigma is that adults who read them are juvenile, right? They're children. So why comics? Why did I choose this? And why, in particular, female superheroes? Well, because they are one of the most un, uh, underserved and underrepresented. Adults who are interested in comics are definitely often very judged. And they actually tend to hide the fact that they're interested in the comics. It carries this nerd image, you know, the bang theory, even though they were all uh, PhDs, right, scientists. And the stigma attached to the production um, makes it kind of distinct as being something low status. Um, one of the things that happens with them is that they've been ignored and they don't get the value that they should. When we talk about comics, right, and popular culture, I focus on superheroes, female superheroes, because of this absence that we see of them or this misrepresentation. <clears throat> As you can see, in terms of popular culture, they are something that hold a lot of value in the study of popular culture. <laughs> I'm sorry, hearing background here. The Library of Congress currently holds more than 140,000 issues. A lot of them are original titles that have been do uh, donated, which are extremely valuable. Anybody here was a collector will know that they sell in the millions, the original copies. And it actually is the largest collection in the US. But one of the things that interested me was that if you open a comic book, right, from any page in its history, you're gonna see America in its pages. You're gonna see this history um, always there, all right? Now, um, go to the next one. <laughs> What do we learn from them? What can we actually learn from comics? Well, some people actually say nothing. There's absolutely nothing you can learn from them. That they have been considered perverse and lewd, that because of them, some people actually don't learn any real literature or any engage in any real learning. Um, but on the other hand, from their humble beginnings of comic strips, they have really matured into works of art. And they're not something new. Comic books are part of art. They're actually what we call sequential art. So if you go back to the Egyptian hieroglyphics, which told a story, that's what sequential art is. And what they did was they just took them all together and made a book. Now, there are actual real world inventions, right? 
that have come out of comics. For example, for the comic book people, Tony Stark, you know his outfit that he makes in the Afghanistan um, uh, case? Rayathon has actually built an exoskeleton that works just like this. And they li can lift up to 100 pounds, kilos easily, all right? And it's used, uh, it was designed to be used by the armed forces. Spider-Man, he actually inspired the modern ankle tracking devices. Two-way wrist radios, remember Dick Tracy? We wear our, you know, what is it, Apple wristwatches now? Uh, flying drones, right? Especially it was Batman who used them. They are inspired by him probably. And Batman, his grappling gun, real life issue. Now, comic books, all right, I value them because they do paint a picture of society. Within their pages, you have entire uh, storylines and story arcs that actually raise awareness to many problems like racism, drug alcohol, abuse, and sexism. They have a very long history of tracking social issues. And very often, real world issues have been highlighted and in their own way remedied, uh, offering suggestions that some of them came to be applied later. They have always explored alternative gender roles. We're going to see that. Uh, Wonder Woman is not an anomaly for that period in terms of the role. She's going to be special for some reasons, but we're going to see that there was many predecessors that gave alternative gender roles to women. And we're talking about the late 30s, which is when we start seeing this uh, emergence of comic books. If you're not into superheroes, there are comic books and graphic novels that explore multiple topics. And they're actually being used in a lot of schools. And in looking at the gender roles, in many ways, what gender roles in comics have done is that they have reinforced them, but in many ways, they've also challenged them. So when we look at comic books, they are definitely, or they can be, a very powerful tool for socialization. What do they actually do? I always say that they mirror society. You know, the, the media in particular is a very powerful tool. It can really influence how we think, what we see, what we feel, uh, what we challenge. And in, in the case of the comics, the comic strips that preceded them, we've always had political cartoons in the newspapers. And very often what the comic books did was they offered you an intriguing, but also entertaining and critical mirror of society. However, it doesn't simply mirror social change. For example, showing non-traditional gender roles, it actually can lead to maybe changing our views about what a traditional gender role should be. Uh, of course, again, on the other hand, they also very often reinforce them because that was another purpose of the comics to kind of support what women in particular should be doing and what they should look like and how they should behave. So we can they can reinforce them again or they can attack them. We're going to be looking specifically in this period, mostly what was called the Platinum Age, uh, which is a brief introduction of the pre-comics until 1938. The real comic book of today starts in this era. Now, the Platinum Age comics were basically newspaper comic strips. Some of those had come from Pulp. Some of them came from the Penny Dread uh, Dreadfuls. Some of those came from the Dime Novels. They were all predecessors. Now, when we look at comic books, they were actually bundled pieces of sequential art. And American comic books are closely linked to the production of comic strips. That's kind of like the evolution that they went through. The media moguls, uh, William Randolph Hearst and Pulitzer, he was, they were the first ones to decide to publish the cartoons in their newspapers, again, to attract readers, you know, always sell more pa papers. Um, before comic books, I already mentioned, you had these different methods, all right? But it is the comic strip that's going to be the most uh, influential, but the comic strip, we featured a lot of pulp magazines, all right, uh, heroes. Now, in particular, the Penny Dreadfuls, you can tell from the name, they were dreadful full of crime and violence. Um, they were actually used at one point in England for a charge of some children using them to kill some of their parents. So they were very violent. And there's a series, I think on Netflix or one of the programs that talks about the Penny Dreadfuls. So they did cover things like vampires and murders and Jack the Ripper, that kind of sensationalism. So they are what we would call today sensationalist uh, or thriller books. The dime novels cost a dime. Those where you get the romance, um, and a lot of the looking for adventure and Wild West. Uh, the pulp magazines were called that because they use cheap pulp paper. But it's in the pulp magazines that we're going to get a lot of early people presented. Um, Tarzan, Edgar Rice Burroughs, first wrote in pulps. And they, um, who else you see? Oh, um, I think it was in the, in the dime novels, but the, um, 
Uncle Tom's Cabin was first produced or displayed on, in that medium. When we talk about newspaper comic strips, they were specifically introduced to the public. So they're going to be a little bit, not so sensationalist, but they did have adventure. And the most famous historically from anybody in that era, and even today is Dick Tracy, right? And the spirit. Now the spirit is interesting because here we get into the supernatural. Here we have the technology, and we're gonna see how superheroes can be technology, or they can be supernatural. But the spirit actually, as you can see, came back to life. Now, one of the things I want to point out to, and again, we talked about um, the idea of enforcing gender roles. They also enforced stereotypes about race. You can see here, Ebony White, typical caricature of African-Americans in that time. But he was his loyal partner, his chauffeur. He actually meets him when he first comes out of his grave and helps him in his adventures. Eventually, he becomes a doctor in the comics, which was interesting for that era. But when we see him here, he's emerging from his script, his crypt, or his burial. And you can see this brings in the whole idea of the supernatural in comics. Let me go to uh, our next one. Now, eventually, what the comic books uh, started to emerge is they started to put them all together at the end into these funnies. And this was like really the first comics, famous funnies. And funny, they're going to be considered the first comic books. But you had other others that emerged. There we have Mickey Mouse, right? Still around. He started off here. The Yellow Kid. He's probably the most significant for this era because his developer um, created this child who was called the Yellow Kid. He had no name. It was a gang of street kids. But you see all the writing here. That's how they used to do writing in the comics. You didn't have the bubble yet that gave you the message. But uh, this uh, artist or cult. He's the one that's actually credited with creating the first bubble that we have. But this was a very popular comic book strip. This one was an underground comic book strip. And we would equate it today to hardcore porn. That's what it was, complete porn, underground. A lot of the people who wrote for it, probably very famous uh, writers and artists, and they did it in secret because it was against the law. And they would take people like Popeye and Olive Oil, Blondie and his wife, Dick Tracy and his girlfriend, and they would put them into very sexual uh, pornographic representations. Again, very popular underground comics. We have here now detective comics. I'm only pointing here because you see the stereotypical image of the yellow peril. This is the turn of the century, all right? The Chinese Exclusion Act. But DC, detective comics, that's the beginning, right? Now, why superheroes? Okay, what, what is my fascination with them? Well, in the year between the cover dates, 1938 to 39, two of the most important characters in comics and in superhero comics first appeared. And there is nothing in modern popular culture that compares to this phenomenon of Superman and Batman and the creation of the superhero. They became the archetype and they have continued to be the key uh, uh, formats and heroes that we look to. Superheroes have their beginnings in the heroes of myth and legend, if you think about it. And they've proved to be an enduring uh, part of popular culture, eventually spreading, as we know, to radio, film, and again, I'm so happy to know, to the big screen, right? Now, why are they valuable? Well, they actually have superhero lessons, okay? Who knew? What do they do? Well, look, they're very powerful, all right? And who doesn't love a superhero? Okay, many people would say, some of the people here, I'm thinking, wow, they're really awesome. So I found a motivational site that had 40 quotes made by them. Unfortunately, hmm, okay, see all the positive things? Well, I found one quote out of 40, actually two quotes out of 40, and made by the same woman. So in 40 quotes, one woman Sipo hero was pre uh, presented. You get the pattern we're starting to see emerge, okay? So when we look at them, um, again, look for these kind of points when I ask you to evaluate what's happening. Okay, so everybody loves a superhero, right? So are you one? Why don't you look at this and check all that apply, all right? Which are you, all right? Which are you? I have a secret identity, by the way. I do. I show all of you do. Now, you know that there's a database, 307 superpowers and abilities are listed in it. <laughs> now, what kind of traits do they have? Oh, wait, let's go back here a second. Notice that there's something they all seem to have. The identity, the costume, form-fitting, the mask is going to be important. 
but you're going to have the fighting skills. You're going to have the vigilante. A lot of them were this, but this is always important. If you don't have this, there's no storyline, but this is only one thing that they need to have. We'll see what the other one is in a little bit. Now, what kind of traits do they have? Well, again, superheroes, superhuman or supernatural and powers. This gives them super strength, of course, super speed, super healing, regeneration, super senses, right? Sensing danger, spidey sense, longevity and immortality. Well, you know, 75 years and Wonder Woman still looks good. She actually looks better every year. And this weakness or Achilles heel, okay? So I'm sure everybody knows Superman's Achilles heel, right? Well, it was a woman who gave it to him. One of the editors of, Superhuman, of Superman at the time felt that Superman was just too perfect and that they were, it's going to get boring. What do we have to do something? So she was the one that success, uh, suggested that Superman should have this Achilles heel and that it would be, of course, kryptonite. Now, the next question you need to consider is, sorry, <laughs> do we need a superpower to be a superhero? Mm, I hope not, because I said I was a superhero, right? And I have a secret identity, but I don't have any powers. So what is important about them? Well, as you can see here, this particular um, quote is that it's their inspire, their way that they inspire and motivate us. And this is one of the things that have been looked at in terms of their impact. Now, when we talk about the superheroes, all right, think about it. Is it actually a requirement? Consider which superheroes do you know do not have powers? Okay, think about it quickly, and then we'll see who they are. Now, of course, who should be number one? Batman? Does he have any superpowers? No. Okay, he's got a lot of money, <laughs> and he has all that technology, right? And he's very athletic, but Superman does not have a superpower. Uh, the, with his nemesis, which tend to be women, Poison Ivy and um, Catwoman, they do. They do have some kind of uh, super senses or supernatural characteristics. Oliver Queen, right? Green Arrow. He doesn't have a superpower, right? He's just really great with that arrow. Uh, the same thing for Hawkman. I don't think Hawkman has any superpowers per se, but he's just really great with that archery that he does, right? Who else doesn't have a, a superpower? Green Lantern, Batgirl, right? Uh, Black Widow, Iron Man. He's got the technology, but no powers. So how many of them were you on the list? Now, how about Thor? Well, Thor has that big hammer. And uh, he actually loses his powers, right, as a god when he comes to Earth. So does he have any superpowers? Not really. So you can see that we've kind of determined that you can be a superhero because you don't need superpowers. Let's look at the Golden Age. The Golden Age is the period that we're looking at, and it's very distinct in its time because this is when it begins, and it begins with pre-Superman, but it's really Superman, and it ends with something very significant in the 50s. And if any of you know your history, censorship, the 50s, we're going to have the same thing happen here in comics. Right? Perhaps one of the most important uh, impact of the Golden Age was that the comic book really became a mainstream art form with its own defined language and its created conventions. This is its start. Now, what kind of took it off? What played a big role? They've been in existence since the end of the 19th century, but it was the Great Depression uh, that the popularity really caused them to rise. And of course, uh, a lot of them were about horror, uh, crime, spirit, Science fiction and westerns were popular, the teen genre, Archie comics, uh, the romance stories for women. Remember, they're supposed to show what role you're supposed to play. And one of the things that happened is, um, is it was the Great Depression. And you needed a very inexpensive art form, uh, or of entertainment, I'm sorry. Look at how many comics, right? They're talking about the Great Depression. 70 million Americans, half of the population read comic books. Now this is pre, they have radio, but this is really early movies and definitely not any of the kind of alternatives we have today. Uh, basically 5,500 5, comic books were published during the World War II era. Okay, that's American comic books. We're talking about different, the, the quantity, but also the variety. And a lot of them, look what take, takes over immediately, the superhero genre. Now, when we look at it, right, another thing that happened was World War II. And World War II is going to really make a major contribution to the growth of, super, of superheroes and comics. One of the biggest short-term effects was the need for reading material for the troops stationed overseas. And comic sales exploded, all right, um, because they were actually sent to the troops overseas. This was one of the major uh, forms of reading that were 
were provided. They were donated by the comic book companies. Uh, they were donated by family. So this became a major form of entertainment for the troops. And nearly 30% of the material right, that was sent to them was comics. Not only, but you know, mostly. And of course, most of the people overseas were men. So you will, you know who the audience was, even though it's always been a male targeted audience, specifically during this period. And to some degree, that's why the comics are going to start to look a certain way. They were a form of fantasy. They were a far cry from the reality of being out in the war in the front, in a war zone. And then, of course, there were the pinup girls. Because when we look at the women in this era, all of them, not just the Hollywood pinups, but all of them are going to have a certain look. And comic book women were pinup girls for the, for the soldiers overseas. So now we're going to get to our first major, well, the first major superhero. And this guy is Superman. He comes out in 1938. He became so popular that he becomes the defining uh, characteristic or trait or push or whatever you want to talk about model for what comic books becoming in America. Now, his two creators uh, had been trying to get their comic book out for a long time with no success. They were offered this opportunity and they jumped at it. And immediately, he was put on the cover, the first cover. I mean, here's a guy basically wearing his underwear outside his clothes leotards, uh, but this comic book cover took off. It, it just fascinated the whole population. And with that introduction, this was it, right? Comic books devoted to superheroes became what everybody wanted to read, and it became what everybody in the medium wanted to uh, copy. In the last pages of the first comic book, this is what um, his creators wrote. Interesting, right? And little did Siegel and Schuster realize how prophetic their words would be, right? After many attempts to promote Superman, they had been rejected. So when they put him on, out there and he exploded, this was like total, um, uh, how do you say it, uh, success. They sold this first one and their contract for 100 I think it was $150. That was it. They had the right to produce all future, but $150 for the Superman rights. They did learn later that this was a mistake. They did fight it. Not great success, but $130. That's how much he was worth when he was first sold. So when we look at comic books today, the publication, this publication redefined what comic books would look like in this era. Now, comic books, again, I mentioned World War II, right? The, another uh, major contribution during this era is going to be propaganda. Propaganda um, was used by, you know, throughout the war and even, even when areas in the war, political and political eras. But definitely during this period, you had a lot of people that were engaged in doing some kind of propaganda from the United States. I'm sorry. Excuse me. All right. So when we look at um, World War II, we see people like um, Walt Disney did cartoons for the military and for the U.S. Dr. Seuss, he did his first cartoons during this era. And many of the comic book artists also start to produce artwork for the comics. And this was one of the things that they used for. Okay, now we get to pictures, okay? No more talking for a while. And here we have examples, okay? Superman says you can slap a jack. Okay, stereotyping, remember the era, pre-World War II. Now, by the way, this is before we've actually gone to war, right? This is before Pearl Harbor. So Europe is already at war, but we're still waiting to make a decision, kind of supporting England, but not really committing to the war directly. Here we have Batman, you know, see what they're promoting. So they were used to promote uh, the war, but also promote supporting the war. Captain America was actually created as a total war icon. Um, wake up Americans, okay, engaging them in the war. And yes, we had a female superhero. <sighs> Miss America, <laughs> yes, and you see her here, please buy a bond. So we're going to see that they played a major role during the war. But interestingly enough, we're going to discover something. They never went to war. Uh, he actually did. He did some fighting. But Superman and Batman, they never left the U.S. All of their adventures are on paper and only on the cover. Okay, They never really actually went to war. And this is going to be important when we meet another character later. Now... Here is how important and the, how the comic books reflect the cultural landscape and political. This is Captain America's first comic book cover, right? When he first comes out. Remember, he's created specifically for the war effort. And look what he's doing. He's punching out Hitler. We haven't even gone to war. We're not talking about going to war. We have a lot of German Americans in the United States at this time who supported Germany. 
And when this came out, it caused such a hassle. They were writing to the editors and newspapers. There were certain German organizations that were protesting that this was discrimination, that this was harassment. Um, but nevertheless, the, the creators, um, they, excuse me, they persisted. Now, one of the things that we're going to see is a general theme about fighting communism later, or in this case, fighting of the Nazis. And one of the things that we need to remember or look into is that the creators of both Superman and Batman and Captain America were young Jewish Americans. Uh, many of them who personally were experiencing the horrors through family uh, information and, and just what was going on in Europe of the Holocaust, even though the height of the Holocaust had not yet been uh, made public. So when we look at this, we see that they, where they were, where they were, but how they were influencing. Now here you have, um, this is before Pearl Harbor, we have Superman fighting, okay, a kamikaze pilot. So you could see that they're trying to influence these authors, these artists were trying to influence America to do something. And of course, there are people who um, protested. Now, you didn't get any backlash for this. The caricatures for Japanese, we're going to see Japanese uh, um, in World War II were very negative. The caricatures for the, uh, the Nazis don't get negative until we actually go to war against uh, Germany. Okay? Uh, female superheroes and the war ethic. I call them the comic book Rosies because just like Rosie encouraged women to go to war, the comic book Rosies, that's what they were doing. They were kind of helping women go into the war effort. And many of them did in their own way. And I loved this. When I found it, I was gonna use Rosie the Riveter, but when I found this one, I said, oh my goodness, this is perfect. Because of all of the people, all of the women in comic books, really Rosie the Riveter has become, um, Rosie the Riveter has become a cultural icon for women in the labor force even today, but Wonder Woman is also a very important cultural icon. And many superheroes were featured during their part in the war. And it's during this period we're going to see a lot of them actually emerge. Now, she emerged during this period also, all right? Uh, and comic books completely reflected the call to arms. And we're going to see that not only in the propaganda, but in the, fe in the features we're going to follow through now. Now, among the earliest, there were many superheroes that were created just for the war. I'm picking up this one in particular because I want you to look at this young lady. <laughs> and she's the black cat. These are some of the earlier ones, but what do you notice about her? Yeah, she's tied up, and that's going to be something we're going to see a lot. But also look at her outfit, and look at the guys. Yeah, their legs are showing, but look at the guys. They're kind of covered in gloves, and yeah, she's got gloves, but look what she's wearing. And we're going to see the rest of her outfit later. And more importantly, she's one of the team, only women, but she's tied up. So that starts to give you an idea of the role that women are going to be expected to play, even the female superheroes in comics. Of course, look at the difference here. We have all men and black cat tied up, but here we have Super Wonder Woman. And what do you notice about her? She's not tied up. If anything, she's out there getting them. See the caricatures I mentioned, Italian, German, and here's the Japanese. But she's got women with her. And one of the things we'll see with her, she was always surrounded with women that helped her in her battle, or she was by herself. And she, I don't think I've ever seen comics of her fighting with any men. She was basically always on her own. But what's important about it is, again, that you see that they are being depicted playing a role in the war effort. During this era, we had a lot of patriotic things for the men, but also the women. These are some of the women that appeared. We're going to talk more about her, uh, but you can see the theme is common. Uh, and except for Miss America and Liberty Bell, and yes, her name is Liberty Bell, and she's got a little Liberty Bell, a little bell. <laughs> she had a little bell on her, off her neck, and whenever there's danger, the big Liberty Bell goes off, and her Liberty Bell tells her where she has to go. Uh, but she's fully clothed. Interesting, right? And of course, she was a young girl, so that's why they clothed her. But look at this outfit. Leg, leg, leg. She's actually more covered, but still, you know, really tight tube skirt there. But you see a common thing here, very patriotic, because that's one of the things that you wanted to do when you wanted to get this, this support for the country in the war. Now, comic books um, started to show in the, the groups during the war, and here we have... War Nurse, yeah, that was her name, War Nurse, Pat Parker. She was actually about a British superheroine made in the United States in 1942. And she was a nurse, and that was her identity, War Nurse, when she became the superheroine. And this was her outfit, right? And, uh, 
and these are the doctors or officers she worked with, and they didn't have a clue that she was the same nurse that was in their operating room, right? Uh, clueless men, I don't know. But notice this here, what do you see? Women. Because one nurse, or Pat Parker, worked with women, and she created this group called the Girl Commandos, who were all women from international backgrounds. And when, look, you see this young lady here, okay? Totally not the stereotypical, long, leggy superheroine. She had women that were pretty much normal and kind of reflected all of the sizes in America, even a plus size. They were with her, and later she stops wearing this. She actually wears an actual uniform, and so do they. They were like a United Nations, and they did fight overseas. And this, So this is actually an American comic book about England, because England had already gone to war. The next comic book actually... Um, came out of Canada. And this one was interesting uh, because of Nev Nelvana. Uh, she was actually an Inuit uh, princess. So here we have in Canada, a super heroine who comes from the native culture there, from the, uh, the native populations. Now, she was created because with the war, only essential supplies were brought in and out of the country and comics from the United States were not considered essential. So then what they did is they started creating their own comic books. Um, and what she did was she was uh, fighting Nazis and she participated in the war. She has another identity. I can't remember her identity now. Alana North. Um, she's a daughter of, of a god, some kind of god from that era. But she did fight in the war. She went and she participated directly in battle. You see her here fighting Hitler again. He was the popular uh, one shown as who you would fight in this war. And uh, she was commemorated after 45 years with a stamp. And Superman got a stamp too because this creator was a Canadian American. Um, Schuster, too many names to remember. Okay, now we have this young lady. And, and you're gonna see why I picked them, I think. You're gonna start seeing the pattern. She was called the Wing, and she's also Canadian. Now, she's a Canadian in Canada, and look at her outfit. I guess the outfit also protected her from cold. I, I couldn't get that one. But what makes her interesting is that she was a Canadian character um, and she fought, just like many women, she worked in a war um, weapons factory, I think, or airplane. So that was her job. She also was a cartoonist, and she, uh, her cartoon character was the wing. And then as, which was her, and as the cartoon character, she would write these comics that told her story when she was the wing, the fighting against the Nazis or, or whoever, the saboteurs in Canada. And, uh, and again, surprise here, she was the wing and her comic book was called The Wing. But look at her outfit and the body. Long, slender legs, kind of tight waist, not so much. She's wearing basically a, a strapless bra here, a tube. She's wearing boots and then she had a cape. That's where the cape comes. Now she could fly, that's what this cape did. Uh, they called her the wing because she could fly. But this is Canada, right? And this is what, 1942? You see the depiction of the woman even then, all right? Let's go to our next uh, lady. Okay, no, let's see who's, who these comic books are for. Actually, you can see the age bracket. Between six and 11 read comic books. And most of them were boys, but a large percentage of girls. So that's why you're gonna have themes and characters that include women and girls. 87%, uh, most of them were still boys, the adolescents, and here it gets lower with women, but this is still a large number for women between 18 and 30. But again, basically we're talking about the depression and World War II, comics were uh, limited. They were limited to what they, they could do. So this is gonna be a major um, outlet for them. Now, when we look at gender roles in comics, which is what we're gonna start looking at now, one of the things that we're gonna see is that they do reflect society. And what are they reflecting? Well, they're reflecting the values of the writer but also of the readers. And we're gonna see that in how women are depicted, but also in the stories that, uh, that are presented. And when we see the numbers of women who read it, what women might also expect to read because they were reading them. So they weren't feeling challenged in any way. And it also is always related very much to the time in which they're published. Because like I said, they do reflect the cultural landscape of the society at the time. What kind of roles did they play? No surprise here, right? And even, this is not superheroes, but they did. Career Girls was a big deal, and we're gonna see what the career was for. The romance was very popular, and this still is. The Perky Teenager, remember Archie, Veronica, and ooh, what was it? Oh, I forgot her other name. Anyway, 
on the con. Girl Fridays, we always had like the secretary, the Girl Friday, the long suffering girlfriend, Lois Lane, talk about she must be the, actually, she is the longest suffering girlfriend in comics, right? Uh, the Femme Fatale. And this is gonna become really prominent after the 50s. If you were a strong woman and independent, then you were also a seductress. And this is something that's been featured even before comics and the role of women. When they become superheroes, you either have the damsel in distress or the evil vamp, which is, again, the femme fatale. Okay, let's see. Now, here we have examples. What kind of careers did they have? Well, you have Tessie the typist. She's in an office, and look at the whole stereotype. Look at her sitting, and she's typing, I guess. But again, look what they're emphasizing. And look at all the men. Crazy, right? So what do you think she's looking for? Probably some businessman, some banker, you know, to get married. Nellie the nurse. Okay, what's she looking for? Marry a doctor. And look how seriously they took her role as a nurse. You know, they're like, oh, you know, everybody's visiting. He's getting much better. Uh, and then Millie the model. Now, this was not necessarily a very high sought after job. It was kind of glamorous. But what do you think she's expecting? Well, she's got this looks like a kind of wealthy um, person there waiting. And she's modeling these clothing, which for that time is going to be kind of suggestive. What do you think she's looking for? And again, the goal is to find someone, male, rich, well, well off, to marry. Because all of these have that theme. They're looking for uh, that perfect future, the marriage and the children. And these were careers that they could engage in that would lead them in that path. We're getting to Wonder Woman, don't worry, but she's uh, not going to be necessarily um, the only one that's important during this era. She is the longest surviving. She's definitely the most well-known. However, okay, here's the bad news. She was not the first powerful woman. She was not the first major having her comics. She was not the first woman to be very physical, showing strength and fighting. Uh, she was definitely not the first one shown fighting and beating up men. Uh, I mean, you know, beating the mad guy, excuse me. She, wore, she was not the one to wear a costume, and she was not the first one with a secret identity. So why is she so special if she wasn't the first? Mm, we'll see. We'll see. I made her special. Don't worry. Now, these women come from women in pulp fiction. That's where they first come from. And these, many of these, this era that crossover between the platinum and the golden, they were originally in pulp fiction in those cheap fashion, uh, cheap public magazines. And then they cross over into what we call the comic, comic books. And that was a big deal for a comic strip person, woman, feel, uh, female um, um, character to cross into a comic, anybody to cross into a comic, but especially for a woman to, a female character to cross into a comic was a big deal. And to survive was a big deal. And that's one of the things that makes Wonder Woman and Lois Lane, because they have both been in comics for over 79 years. And we're actually going to see that Lois Lane has been at it longer than Wonder Woman, because Superman, Superman came before uh, Wonder Woman. But in the 1930s, there were a number of heroines that appeared in these magazines. And they actually had some very interesting careers and goals, uh, roles, and they were not traditional. They were not the traditional gender expected uh, jobs, roles for women. Um, and interestingly enough, we're going to see a lot of them were the ones that were always coming to the rescue. Because it's going to be a general trope in comics, the damsel in distress. And these women were not damsels in distress. All right. And one of the first ones, and I picked her because she actually started off in those underground magazines where she was basically always naked. And she went from being a naked, <laughs> a naked um, nudie girl in distress to being a detective and kind of dressed her all up. But what's important about her is, even with her trans besides her transition, she was the first female detective in comics. All right? So she actually made a transition into a, man a man's role from a female role <laughs> to not, a, not, not necessarily a, a value one in society to a detective, a male role. And she did the detecting. You know, she was the one that carried out a lot of the investigations during this time period. Again, I'm getting the pages here. Okay. The next one we have is Olga Mesmer, the girl with the X-ray eyes. She wasn't around for too long. She wasn't really a superhero, but there were some of her traits that were carried over to other people. And there's actually a particular comic book historian who says that she was kind of the type that was used for Superman because some of her powers, X-ray vision and strength, an alien come from Superman. 
And you do know that Superman's an alien, right? And you talk about the ultimate alien, he's from another planet. Uh, so when we talk about comics, that was the point I didn't raise, this question of diversity in comics comes out early. You have people that are not from here, that are that come here and become part of the society and kind of fight for the society, which is what she did do. So here you can see, though, from the pulp, the look. And she was always in some way undressed, <laughs> barely covered. Uh, but she was powerful, and she basically was the one in charge. 1937, very early. Okay, Let's go to our next character. Uh, Sheena, queen of the jungle, the jungle queens, white in the jungle. Now here we get into that typical group you have, the distressed people in distress. In this case, though, it's a man. Yeah, this is her mate. It wasn't her husband or her fiance. Everybody knew he was her mate. Um, he comes into Africa pretty much like the Tarzan and Jane story, except that she's Tarzan and I guess he's Jane or not, because Jane seems to be more independent than him. Uh, and he decides to stay and he lives with her in a tree house and she's always kind of naked. She's actually better dressed here because when he meets her, she's kind of like in a torn up clothing and then she gets this outfit. But she's the jungle queen and she was always in charge. She was the fighter. See the stereotype here of the Africans? Now, she's also very early. She started in Great Britain. Within one year, she's hit this, the United States, and she is the first female comic book character with her own comic book. That's what makes her outstanding. She also was interesting in other ways. She, uh, there were actually, I think, four incarnations of her, and she had um, several movies made as early as, I think, like the 50s and 60s, even up to today. So she's, she's long lived. <laughs> she's, lived she's been there a long time. Um, and still that, that question of how women should look in comics, because remember, they are the wartime pinup girls. And there she is, long legged, um, blonde, white. I was typical. Let's go to our next character. Yes, she's wearing a negligee or something. But this is Fantoma. She's actually been brought back in modern times, kind of in the same outfit or at least the same face. Now she is important because she precedes February, precedes Wonder Woman who comes in December. And she's uh, the first titled as a female superhero in comic books. They actually use that title for her. And some people are saying that she may be the first. Um, and she's also the first one that had like an, all, I'm sorry, let me go back here. She's the first one who had an alternate look because she goes from this beautiful woman to this really fantastical, ugly, vengeful uh, goddess. And she was very violent. You violated the laws of the jungle or wherever she was, and you were seriously punished by her. So here she's a defender of nature, a defender of the environment, defender of her society. Um, and uh, yeah, but she's wearing a negligee. Again, typical uh, depicting, right? But she's, like I said, she's the first one who had a dual identity because here she is in her Fantoma part and here she is in her other Fantoma. I don't know what her name was as the goddess, but Fantoma is her evil side, I guess. Now, one of the things that comes out in this period very uh, um, immediately is the female crime fighters. And what's important about it, they did the, the rescuing, all right? And I mentioned them. Here are two famous ones, again, 1940 and 1940. <laughs> These are, she was a detective, a police detective, who got tired of the criminals getting away. And uh, she's a woman in red, a man in red, sorry. Um, and she's considered the first female mass crime fighter. She wore this hood, uh, she had her mask, she has her gun because she's a police woman, but she is a vigilante. But look at her outfit, again, the legs. Now she, she's a rich debutante, was bored, and she, did, she dies to become a detective. Her mask is not very, you know, hiding much. But look at this, look at her here. Very acrobatic, right, with her dress. This was her costume, by the way. And nobody figured her identity. So Lady Luck. Uh, then we have this young lady, 1940. Now, she's important because she's considered the first female with powers. Now, Scarlett O'Neill, her father was, I think, a scientist. She sticks her finger, curious female stereotype. She sticks her finger in some kind of a ray gun, and then she becomes invisible. Um, and she realizes it. In her case, she's interesting because her boyfriend knew that she, you know, he wasn't clueless like some of the others. The men around them had no clue, even though they looked the same. Uh, but she became invisible. Now, here I want to raise an issue. It's ironic, isn't it, that the first superhero, female superhero woman is given a power to be invisible. So she's kind of recreating the same role she plays in real world, right? Women were invisible in many parts of society. But again, she's important. Her comics survived for 10 years. She worked alone. She solved crimes. And she had a superpower. Yeah, right? <laughs> uh, 
Okay, the next one I picked out is Betty Bates. And she was depicted very professional because she was the district attorney in New York City in 1940. Definitely not a role you saw in women. And she's considered the first female lawyer in comics. She did her own fighting. She did her own investigations. And she was a lawyer, uh, district attorney. Now, her, her characterization is unique in a way, again, because this is a female lawyer in, in those days. Now, this is a little bit out of sequence, but I wanted to show you She-Hulk. <laughs> I know, She-Hulk, right? Why? Because she's a lawyer. I think she's the only other superhero today, female superhero with powers um, and a job, right? She has a real you know, career too, a lawyer. When she first came out, <laughs> She-Hulk, as you can see, burst out of her clothing. And this is the same shirt she's wearing here. I don't know how it covered the body. But she's kind of well clothed, isn't she? Considering that she's got an excuse to be naked. And even when she's made in modern times, her costume is kind of revealing, but not for the times. So here is this woman who becomes this big, giant, oversized woman who has an excuse to go around naked and doesn't. She's not depicted that way. And I don't think it's just because of the comics, because she's never really depicted that way. And I'm wondering in my mind, why her? Is it because she becomes a big woman and, and big women are not sexy? You know, you have these, these questions that I think about. But she really even here is not as sexualized as she could have been and we will see many women were later uh, okay let's see who our next person is okay secret identities oh i can't get it the next one is called secret identity and what we're talking about here specifically is a female cartoonist and she's linked to um miss fury miss fury was marla drake she's a rather rich socialite she's bored she gets this costume which uh, is a black panther costume from africa from a witch doctor which has voodoo powers so they had no idea where voodoo and african witch doctors come from like two different things but what's important about her is that she's the first female superhero written by a woman who hid her identity because if they knew that she was a woman writing comics about superheroes male and female they wouldn't take her serious and she says this herself so she didn't use her full name all right. She only used this kind of like androgynous name. Um, and her comic book is one of the longest lasting. This Miss Fury, one of the longest, longest lasting ones in history. She kind of disappears in the 1950s and we'll find out why. But here you see her fighting. OK, there it is. Right. The Germans and the Japanese. So she was definitely one of those war, World War Two hero, heroines. Now, Phantom Lady, she's a daughter of a senator and she saves his life. And why did I pick her? Well, She's typical of the time and how she looks, but she basically tells you in her comic that she's gonna dress this way because she's gonna use her power, her female sexuality to distract her opponents. So she's always dressed like this and she uses it to, you know, get the bad guys, right? So this is someone who openly embraced that sexuality and uh, utilized it for fighting. Black Cat. She is, I think, called Hellcat now, but she also appears in 1941. So you see there's like a big number of them showing up. She's one of the earliest masks. She's not the first, but she's earliest mask. And she was uh, in a lot of the um, scenes with other superheroes fighting, like she went to war. She's the one that we saw kind of tied up, but you can see her outfit. She's got these uh, pirate boots and she's got this opera mask and she's got the, and this big deep plunge. This is 1941. Women didn't even wear bathing suits like this, okay, when they went to the beach. So, again, uh, contradictions of the time, right? I chose her because Senorita Rio, the Queen of Spies, is probably one of the only very rare Latina presented in comic books. She was not a superheroine. She was a spy. She comes in the 40s. Uh, and she was drawn by a female artist, which makes her unique in that time. We're going to have more female artists during the war because the men went off to war and the male reporters went off to war. But she's the first one drawn by a woman. But that doesn't mean that she's not going to have the typical drawing, right? And that she's got chains. But what's also interesting is she's a spy. I mean, that's what her role is. And yet she's called a femme fatale. It's like devaluing her... Uh, being a spy and more like that question of being the vamp. Uh, and she was Latin. Maybe there's a relationship there. Could you, maybe. Now, I chose her, and you're going to laugh why, but you'll see. Um, Louise Grant, she's a secretary to a detective that she's always getting out of trouble, who never realizes that she's his secretary. And this is her costume. I'm not kidding. She wore this long ball gown with the heels. 
and this mask, and this was her costume. She is one of the few that come to the modern era, and she's got the same costume except it's short and tighter and shows more skin. Um, but yeah, Floor Lane's evening gown, right? Uh, again, detective though, and she worked with her, her boss was the detective, but she's the one that is doing all of the crime fighting. This is a period where you have the superheroes coming in, so we're going to get to Wonder Woman now. But you see that there was a close progression very quickly. You have all of these, you know, within like the same year, uh, Batman, Superman, Captain Marvel, Hawkman, Captain America, and then Wonder Woman. Now, what makes her distinct more than anything is that she's the first widely recognizable one. So these are all of them, and you can see the years. We're going to go now to the first Black Widow, who actually, we only use her name for the current Black Widow. She came in 1940, so she predates uh, Wonder Woman. She was interesting because she's an anti-hero. You don't usually have any of those. So she was basically someone who lived in hell, who Satan sent out to capture souls that escaped from hell. They never tell you why she's in hell, but she basically is kind of a good guy because she comes out of hell to help people. You didn't have this kind of... Uh, character in the comics, but it's her name that's interesting because her name will then be used by Black Widow later, right? And we know who the next Black Widow is. Uh, but before her, we have Black Canary. She came in right away. And she has one of the most impractical practical costumes ever, okay? Even, even, even modern times, look at her in 2015. She's got fishnets. She's got basically like a bra here and a little jack bolero, and that's what she wears. Um, but she's among the first, and then she doesn't have the canary uh, sonic scream until later. Uh, but she's been reinvented. But they didn't get rid of the fishnets. What is it with the fishnets? You know, this is like a costume. I don't know how she, at least this is more realistic than this one, right? But she's an early character. And then we have the Miss Americas. She was actually, got her powers from Liberty Bell. She comes and goes. And yes, yeah, she's running with heels and a mini skirt. Um, here. So she was in the war and then she kind of disappears quickly in 41. She disappears and then they bring in Madeline Joyce. Madeline Joyce is funny because she's a young girl. She's one of the most modest costumes, but she couldn't, uh, she used to use glasses like Clark Kent. Uh, but then eventually in the comics, she wears them all the time. So she's considered like the first nearsighted comic book heroine. She makes it to the modern time as an adult. Now here we have the Black Widow. She comes back, the same name in 1964. There's the fishnet again, <laughs> popular. Uh, she comes in as a spy. She's a reformed Avenger, still wearing the fishnets. And then here's her modern version, which is where we see her with the red hair. And this is what she, this, this is the look she got in 1970. She still has much of this look. But she's always, in the, uh, Natasha Romanova has always been a reformed Russian, Russian spy. And now we're going to see the Captain's Marvel. And the first one was actually a man, 1939. He was really a boy, like 12 years old, who got this power, say Shazam, and he became a man. He gives his power to another young boy, Lieutenant Marvel. And then he finds out he has a sister, Mary Marvel. But they, while well, he becomes a man with the name saying Shazam, she stays a little girl. But she's the first Mary Marvel. Then you have in 67, uh, Captain Marvel coming back, and he's an alien. He eventually has this kind of this outfit, but notice that here he's in green because he's an alien. Um, he dies in 1982, and look who shows up, even though they don't do a connection. But there was a, the first uh, Captain Marvel in modern times, I guess, 82, is Monica Rambeau, and she's an African-American woman. Interesting, right, that she would be a Captain Marvel. And then we have this inc incarnation, which is in 2012, when Carol Danvers, Carol Danvers appears in, in Marvel's comics. Yeah, his name is Marvel, but then they start calling him just Captain Marvel because they didn't understand his name. He's a, an alien, that accent. Um, but she then... Works, she meets him, she's suspicious of him, but then she becomes first Miss Marvel. We're going to see her here. She first becomes Miss Marvel in 10 years later, about um, because she's hurt. But look at the outfit. Now, I call these the spineless women defying gravity, and you can tell why, yes? <laughs> but look, she's got no waist. So we're her organs, right? Long, at least she's got no heels. And then she will become um, Miss Mar uh, Captain uh, Marvel. We saw her in 2012, and then this is 22. This is when we have a big tra uh, transformation of women where they all look like this, right? Um, and you can see why they spineless and defying gravity, right? Okay, let's go to the next one. Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman appears, and she is an icon. I mean, from the beginning. And she was meant to be a feminist icon. She was created purposely for this role. You can see that she doesn't look typical at all. And 
uh, Gloria Steinman was so impressed by her that she actually used her on the cover, the cover of, of uh, Wonder Woman, of Miss, uh, Miss Magazine, Wonder Woman, uh, because that's what she saw her as a feminist icon. Now, Wonder Woman's creation is interesting, but she was purposely created to be exactly that. When her creator, creator um, Mars, uh, William Mar um, Marston, oh God, Marston, when he created her, he wanted a feminist icon. He was a feminist. He lived with two feminists. They were actually both his wives. One was his uh, legal wife. The other one was his uh, domestic partner. They lived together in the same house. After he died uh, of cancer in like 47, the women stayed together and they raised the children that they had with him. And they are actually credited with creating Wonder Woman, uh, influence him. She is the most famous. She was a feminist icon um, and she was created with, with in mind, the purpose in mind to challenge the roles. When he created her, he said he wanted a woman that young girls wanted to be, that um, young girls, you know, no girl wanted to be a superhero if they were depicted the way that they were depicting them or if they were ignored from the, the traditional, uh, from the genre at that time, male superheroes. And he created her specifically throughout this period to challenge all of these ideas. Uh, the bracelets that she wears in her wrist are the marriage wedding bands that Olive Byrne, um, his domestic partner, uh, wore. His wife was a psychologist. She helped him the, write the, the, make the lie, detect, lie detector. But Olive Byrne lived with him. Now, she was the niece of Margaret Sanger. So you see that he lived in a household with feminists. And as a result, his, his um, characterization of Wonder Woman was very feminist. He wanted someone to challenge the roles and to be this model for not just young girls either. He says in his writings that he purposely wants to her, make her model from young boys as how they think a woman could and should be. Now, her costume and her body are not as um, uh, provocative as the ones we've seen. But still, for her time, she's not dressed how uh, women dressed, right? She's still wearing this like bustier. She's got boots with heels. <laughs> and she basically gets rid of this cool out for these tight pants. And when she came out, even though she was popular, one of the things that were questioned was why is she so flat chested? Because she definitely does not pick depict the women that we've seen. But one of the things that's very clear about her that from the beginning, she was very much one to address social issues. Her comic book was supposed to be fun, um, and most of them have come, you know, there are more that came before her, but none of them have lasted like her. And what happened to her was that she was embraced. Even though she kind of challenged the traditional role, she was still embraced. And while she had this look, which was not typical, I mean, she's more like athletic, um, and she was muscular a little bit, uh, but she was supposed to be, and she also is not blonde. You know, this was this was different. This was something new. Yeah. And one of the things that's key about her is she was never a damsel in distress. Never. She was not meant to be. If anything, Steve Trevor is her mansel in distress because she's always saving him and she's always putting him off about getting married. At one point, she's going to become more typical in other ways, but she is not your typical um, damsel in distress. Right. OK, what happened to comics? Well, you have the menace during the Red Menace. Um, of the McCarthy era, it, it goes into the comics. And the key person who has to do that with that is Bert Ham. He actually got the Senate hearings to look at comics. And one of the things that he, ch he basically stated in comics were um, that they corrupted and led to juvenile delinquency, that they were violent, and that Batman was homosexual or there was homosexual intent in his comics, and that Wonder Woman was into bondage and uh, she was a lesbian. So you could imagine what happened uh, when this came before the Senate. Uh, they started investigating it, and then he, when they showed these kind of images, you know, now think about it. How do you know in the comics someone's in trouble? Well, they have to be tied up, right? How do you know who has to be rescued? Well, they have to be tied up. So this is not necessarily an, an issue of bondage. This is just how do you know? But this was what was associated with her. They also do make that association with um, Batman. And the messages during this time were very clear because of the imagery. Here you see her with her women, because she always had women, the holiday girls. But <laughs> in here you see that they actually alluded to a homosexual relationship between Batman and Robin. 
Um, and here he's marrying someone that looks like Brenda Starr. I don't know. But in any case, you see how they're making a comment like they never thought he would do this. And Robin looks like, OK, what am I doing here? What is going on here? He actually has a girl. So the comics, you know, did kind of think this message was in there. So what happened with the comic book industry is they decided we're going to stop this before they start censoring us. Uh, and here we have Miss Fury. Now you know why she lasted until 1950. Uh, even though she was written by women, her comics were very, very explicit. You see her here, like she's really showing a lot of body. Um, and she, in 1957, I think, I know that she that she had some comics that were being shown, and uh, because she she was in a bikini, they you know 307 newspapers dropped her. But I mean, the bikini might have just been minimal. Look at this here, right? Okay, so basically, what the comic, you know, what this this code, the comics made this comic, this code at this time, and it totally crippled the industry. It totally did. They decided that that the only relationship that can be shown in comics of women was one where there was a relationship and that it lead to marriage. And what happens is, Wonder Woman traditional role, she's given a family. Uh, everything with her is that she's in love and and Steve Trevor and you know they're going to get married because he's always asking and very romantic. Uh, she in the 60s, 60s, she gives up her powers and right after she gives them up, he dies. So I don't know. That was kind of worthless there. And then he dies and then she just is crying through most of the rest of this era. She totally missed the 70s. Uh, right. And what they do is they start to introduce these other figures. Now, she's interesting because to kind of get back to basics and attract children, they have this young girl called a tomboy who is this frilly little girl in frilly bows and dresses who becomes a tomboy and fights crime. She has no powers. But I found it interesting that she's a tomboy, right? So she's given still the characteristic of a male fighting in her secret identity. But this is what the comics are going to become like, you know, more pressing, uh, focusing on children or romantic relationships. Let's look at the girlfriends. Why do we have them? <laughs> They're not serious. Why do we have them? Well, you need certain characters. You need the hero, the villain, the interest, and you need a sidekick. And one of the things we're going to see in most of the comics are the sidekicks. So Etta Candy and the Holiday Girls are Wanda women. Oh, excuse me, all women. You see, she's a plus size woman, totally counter to her. Um, we have here why you need the, the, the them. You need them for the sex appeal because you want male readers. You need the romantic line. You need the damsel because somebody has to be saved. You need the woman trying to get the secret identity, the curiosity. Uh, you need to reinforce traditional gender roles. And of course, for Batman to prove he's not a homosexual and for Wonder Woman that she's not a lesbian, give them um, heterosexual relationships, right? Now, so Lois Lane is one of the longest lasting uh, comic book characters, female. She appears in the first issue of Superman and this is the famous scene that you'll see depicted being carried by her. She comes off as the toughest nails reporter in the beginning and then after the comic book code, right? Look at her, right? She's totally thinking about marriage. That's it. Anybody, Clark Kent, Batman, Aquaman, whoever comes along. So she goes from being this award-winning reading reporter as a damsel in distress. Very often it was her search, because she was a reporter, and she's, by the way, called the girl reporter. And later she's Lois Lane, Superman's girlfriend. So even with her own comic, she doesn't get the top billing. And what we're talking about there is how they're portraying them. They're portraying comics in a particular way, and it's basically how society views them. So the biggest criticisms have been the sex question of sexuality, uh, the brutalization, how they're tokens, how they're expendable. And what we see is uh, their powers are not as important, as powerful, they're not as intelligent, and they, get, they have powers that are more like empathy and intellect rather than super strength. So Wonder Woman is the exception. And then we have the language. You have the X-Men, which are three guys and a girl. So why do they call them the X-Men, right? And then when they do get a partner, they all call girl. They're men, these are women, but they all call girl. Just like Lois Lane is called girl reporter and Superman is called Superman and Clark Kent is the male reporter. He's not the boy reporter, but she's the girl reporter. And then their jobs. Uh, Sue Storm is one to make a hit in the 60s of, of a new group that is introduced. She's one of the Fantastic Four, but look at her job. They show her pouring coffee, they show her doing shopping, they show her fainting when she uses her powers. Uh, and then guess what her power is again? Invisible woman, right? Here she's got like clothing distress. They kind of depicted these roles, even though she's supposed to be one of the Fantastic Four. And then I found this one interesting because it talks about the Fantastic Four, but where is she? 
Of course, she's the invisible woman, but still, you know, at least show something. So again, even when she's part of a team, she was not part of a team, right? Okay. Um, if they're so different, their world from ours, why, you know, why are they in comics? Well, basically they're used as a story arc. When you want the main character to have a reaction, um, you get rid of them. And this is called uh, Women in Refrigerators because Green Lantern found his girlfriend chopped up in, in the refrigerator. So the expression is, you've been fridged. So in comics, if somebody's fridged and Lois was fridged, here she finally gets married. <laughs> this is her dream, right? And she's fridged, right? Doesn't even get out of the church. Uh, but this is a common uh, 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 common thing to happen. And it's mostly women, although some men get fridged. Robin, there's a male Robin that got fridged. And the only female Robin got fridged. Uh, and it was sad because the male Robin got fridged by the um, audi uh, fans. They decided they wanted him killed. Why do I look like this? <laughs> Why do I look like this? This becomes the image of the 80s. And it proceeds pretty much until like the recent. Now they've only started changing them. It basically deals with how women are portrayed. I always like this comment. I'm not bad. I'm just drawn this way. And basically they have these characteristics. The male gaze is that in general, it's men that are looking at the women and they're painting them and even like as if looking from a camera. Also the idea of what would be the ideal woman. The headlight comics is that all of these comics from the pulp era on, they focus on this part of the body and they used to call them headlights. So they actually had a whole line of headlight comics. And then there's the broke back test. And this has to do with putting them in these positions that you wonder how can they live? I mean, they show all the body parts at once. This is Wonder Woman. And then they have this little tiny, tiny waist. And you wonder, is there a spine in there? Or how do they move? Uh, so this is called the broke back pose. Because if they really did it, they would probably break. You know, what kind of position is that, right? So why do they look like this? Males create it. The audience has been males, mostly adolescents. Uh, during World War II, it was men in the armed forces. And of course, women don't read comics. Is that true? <laughs> Here is Wonder Woman in 1994. Sales were down, and guess what he wanted? He wanted to bring up the industry, and circulation shut up when they brought back Wonder Woman like this. So obviously, why do they look like that? Well, sex sells, and that's that's the message, right? Sex sells. I'm trying to speed this up here because we're close again. Okay, there was a study done by um, BBC, and basically said that girls do need super heroines, female super heroines. And they need them because we need to get away from the stereotypes. We don't want the image, which seems to be that women are undervalued, that they're sexual objects, that, you know, because this creates low expectations and this is what they feared. So, and when they do have them, they don't promote the sense of empowerment. They're damsels in distress. Uh, and the impact unfortunately is that young men expect digital divas to be this way but they also expect their girlfriends to be this way. But more importantly, it makes girls feel that they're unrealistic standards that they have to meet. And it makes, of course, real women definitely dull in comparison, right? So when this study was done by BBC, they found that girls actually said that when they saw these female sci-fi and superheroes, it made them feel this way. So what they were demonstrating was that presenting these positive images can present a positive uh, attitude or, or develop it in young girls, but also young men, boys, because they're seeing women in a different role as powerful women. Today we have new, new reinvented artists, as you can see. Um, Miss Marvel is now Kamila Khan. She's Pakistani and Muslim, and she's become very popular. There was a, a, a question and a fear that she would be turned away, and there was some question people want the traditional superheroes. But she's become very popular. And she's an example of how the comics do show diversity. And then Miss America Chavez is a new one. Uh, she's, she's from another dimension, but she has two mothers. All right. So again, the whole question of, and she is a, a lesbian, that she's portrayed as a lesbian. And she's also been received very positively. So when we see what's happening today, we see that there is a, there are changes. And of course, the two new superhero movies that hit the, the hit recently have definitely presented these women in completely different light. And I think that's a positive thing. They're powerful, they're beautiful, they're sexy, they're powerful, but you don't have to have them naked. She's a little bit more uh, less dressed, but still, this is tasteful and it doesn't impede her fighting. And she's got boots, but they don't have, you know, she's not doing it in stilettos. She's got a platform. That's more practical, right? So what are their real powers? What are the issue? 
what this what distinguishes these women, uh, female superheroes from the males? They both have many characteristics. They're tough, they're strong, they have powers. Bullets bounce off their chest, although for the women they may bounce a little more. Fight, although they do it in stilettos, which is right there is a superpower, right? So how are they different? The biggest question has basically been that they challenge male sexuality or challenge men. And female superheroes have been devalued. And it may be perceived because they're dangerous, because women can do something men basically, they can, but it's harder to do. They can combine their toughness with their threat of, threat of seduction. So one might add that women are all superheroes, right? And in case you did or didn't see, spoiler, um, Captain Marvel, in the end, isn't she the one who saves the world? So in conclusion, what are their real powers? What do you think? You tell me. It was a pleasure. <laughs> you want to contact me and you want like reading uh, reference lists, I can email it to you. And there's my secret identities. Um, I chose this, by the way, because two of my favorite characters are Captain Peggy Carter from Captain America, and she's Agent 13. But more important, today, in case you didn't know, uh, the new Doctor Who is finally a woman. So the 13th Doctor Who is a woman. And that's why I chose the secret identity. So email me if you want uh, references, reading lists to any of these. And I'm getting a website together and it'll have superhero trivia, things that I couldn't include in here because I didn't have time. I hope you enjoyed my presentation. And if you have questions, all yours. <laughs> So, I don't know. <laughs> Alex, am I still on? I, I kind of lost track of what's going on here. Hello. <laughs> Any questions at all? Yes. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay, because I didn't hear anything. So I've been saying, is anybody, anything happening? Okay. Yeah, I'm looking for them. I'm trying to see. Um, I don't see anyone's yet. Uh, okay, I wanted to add elementary. Yes. You know, they have found that there's actually a cognitive, they're doing cognitive studies with comics today. And uh, I'm going to let you go, Alex. <laughs> they're cognitive studies today. Uh, being done on the value of comic books because they really engage a couple of senses. Um, they're using them to write books, the children writing books. I'm looking for a question. Any, there's some questions? I don't see the questions. Yeah, they, they basically, one of the reasons they said that they weren't going to create comic books for women because women don't read comics and they're not interested in superheroes. But there's been a big increase and a big support. Today, uh, it's still mostly men, but there's about 37%, they've discovered 30% of women uh, read comics, which is not a bad number. It's about a third of, of you know, the, re the readers. Uh, they haven't done a real study and they're not, they don't know if there's, this popularity is linked to, um, if it's linked to because... Um, how was I going to say it? They don't know if it's linked to the comics themselves or because of the new superhero movies have really presented women in such a different light and that this has been very, very uh, positive uh, and brought people into um, the show. I'm looking for questions, but I don't see any questions. Oh, you asked about the viewing. Uh, I believe, yes, that, um, and they won't be like such a you know, speed, speed, and I probably, maybe I'll, maybe I'll add the trivia questions to it, but I think the Humanities Council is, uh, did videotape this, and you will have access to it, and once my website is up, if I can get somebody to develop it, uh, you know, I have a, you know, nephew-in-law that might help me with that, if he's watching, um, but I did want to do a website for uh, other events and different topics because I'm interested in diversity in topics too and I have uh, one that's black superheroes the Black Panther but also diversity in general in comics hmm. so there will be a on YouTube I think the person the best place to contact is the Humanities Council themselves uh, Alex Burrell at the council and they'll get, probably give you information um, it I don't know specifically how blacklisting affected comic books and producers in, in the comic industry. 
It wasn't done directly by the Senate. The Senate meetings were held, but then the comic book industry stepped in because they didn't want to be censored. Uh, but what they did was they killed comics. You know, but after the war, a lot of the superheroes started to diminish. Uh, Batman was still produced. Captain America died pretty much for a while there, and then he comes back. But the only ones that really survived throughout Steady, even with a, kind of a low dropping of her in different periods, the three key ones that have survived are Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman. And then when Spider-Man comes in, he doesn't come in until the 60s, I believe. Uh, he's a Marvel. Um, then he takes over. So they did their own censorship, and, uh, and I don't think they blacklisted, they just controlled them. We had a lot of women um, in comic books during the war because the men were off to war. When the men came back, they lost those jobs. Uh, Lois Lane basically showed the same thing. She got to write more and got to put in scoops when she was a reporter, but the same thing happens after the war. She kind of like, it's only the romantic interest. So they were monitoring and rel rel uh, controlling their own, so they weren't blacklisted per se. Um, they just, and if they did, it was, you know, it was kind of a private industry in that sense. And they wanted to make money. So if you made money, they just, and a lot of people wrote under different names. Uh, that underground pornographic comics that I told you about, a lot of major writers from the industry wrote there. They just didn't use their name because it was also illegal. Looking for questions. <laughs> Yeah, the the remember, you know, this one, the slap a jab, remember the era, okay? And it's not like we're even far behind now, but this was pre-World War II, um, and there was always, there was already, you know, the end, the, this era that we're talking about, the transition to modern, uh, you, you know, modern 20, uh, 20th century at that time, you had um, this whole uh, anti-Asian, you know, the, the Chinese Exclusion Act, um, and I know any any ex Asians because it was a Chinese Exclusion Act, but it also banned uh, people just from China, from uh, from um, Philippines, even though there was a U.S. territory. It banned people from uh, Japan, and they had to make a special agreement uh, to bring scientists over, and that's you know a, a transition that was made. But so this was very typical, and then we were at war with them, you know, and we were at war with them. So it was okay, but you saw the caricatures for the African Americans. And even the Germans were not portrayed very, very nicely there. And Mussolini, you saw his face when she's trying to knock him down. Yeah, I love Agent Carter. I, I was so sad when her show was, was off, was taken off. I thought it was so positive. You know that Cap Agent Carter was his love of, of Captain America's life? But then her niece, Sharon Carter, is his new love of his life. I don't get that. But then he goes back to Agent Carter. But that's comics, right? Uh, anything else? Yeah, I'm looking here for any questions. Okay, comic books and gra graphic novels, uh, I don't talk about them at all and I'm not into them, but they are also uh, the other top. Besides comic books, they're the other form of, of this kind of, you know, sequential art uh, and artist uh, stories that are out there. Uh, in Japan, the graphic novels, uh, manga, I think they're called, that's that's very, uh, just as popular there as comic books. Comic books are not an American invention, but they definitely have become like uh, an American um, genre or an American characteristic. Uh, yeah, people tell me they lost it. <laughs> they lost yeah. it. I managed to get oh, back. I, I see family members. Thank you for coming, Maida. Okay, I, any, anything else? Any questions? <laughs> yeah, they actually, for Marston and um, his wife, his wife was very well educated. He was a lawyer. He, they, he studied at Harvard. He was a lawyer and a psychologist, and so was his wife. And she was the breadwinner. And Olive Byrne, who was his living lover, she became the domestic partner, not only that they lived together, like in marriage, but also that she raised the children. He died in 47 from cancer. And that's another reason the comics changed drastically after 47, because he wasn't able to write them. And then his his goal, his feminist ideas, and even her look changed. But uh, but they lived together 40 years after his death. And there were, there were actually uh, stories that they were really all lovers, the three of them. Um, and her, her family challenged that. Her family has challenged that. Uh, <laughs> oh, okay, I'm gonna look this up. The comic novel Mouse, I didn't know that. See, I the teacher learns. Yes, I think that comic books have definitely been ahead of the curve. And the reason I think about this is because 
they were fantasy and in this fantasy world they were able to do whatever they wanted but when we look at comics there has always been diversity there have always been uh, alternative gender roles for women they weren't necessarily positively all accepted all the time um, and sometimes people forgot these women were in these non-traditional roles i mean you know she's wearing a skirt that shows her leg all the way up to her hip bone uh, to fight, to fight, like ride the ball gown, but she's still a detective. She's still fighting. Uh, the one that was interesting, I forgot which one of them. One of them uh, always found, always naked, but she always found. Oh, I think it was Sally Sue. She was always naked or almost naked, and she always managed to pull out a gun and, and catch her criminal. But they definitely did show diversity, and maybe they did it indirectly. But definitely today, comic books are openly. Uh, really presenting and, and ahead of their time. Um, during the civil rights era, comic books addressed um, lynching and they addressed civil rights and they addressed diversity and they addressed this idea of you know inclusion. Um, so they definitely have been. Uh, anything else? I don't know. I'm looking. Okay. Yes, I think you got a, a comment that it's being it's going to be mail available. Yeah, and then I threw up the. Um Anything else? I think, yes, uh, that there's another little survey that we did here. I hope that you got, uh, you came in with one idea and that you leave with another. Uh, for me, it was a pleasure doing this, especially because um, I like these, this topic and I like sharing it. I really do. And I see so many of my friends join me. I guess they miss me. <laughs> um, I do live in Orlando now. I moved from Miami, so there's a lot of my family and friends I don't get to see. Hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. All right. Can, and can, please can come back and see the other programs. Yeah. They're all great. Magdalena, can you can you hear me? I can't tell if I'm uh, coming through or not. Nope. I guess not. Magdalena, can you hear me okay? Nope. Okay, well. Okay, some people can hear me. <laughs> I guess just not our speaker. Anyway, uh, I had some technical issues there with my internet towards the end. I apologize for that. But uh, I really appreciate all of you guys tuning in. And uh, please fill out the survey before you sign off. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again. Um, next week. Uh, I, I'll see your message. If you submit a comment, uh, I'll, I'll be able to see who submitted it if you need some follow up. All right. Well, if there are no other uh, comments or questions, we'll go ahead and sign off. Thanks again for tuning in and hope to see you guys next week. Have a good night.